inability of blood vessels to grow inside of the lung that makes this condition very, very difficult to treat. So when one looks at the normal transition and how a baby should go from being in utero to being born, you have your pulmonary vascular resistance on the left side, and if we follow the yellow line, as a fetus, that increases throughout gestation. But after birth, we should see a, a dramatic fall in pulmonary vascular resistance. And it's those factors, increasing oxygen tension inside of the blood, ventilation, even with just the baby breathing spontaneously on its own, and then the release of different dilators into the bloodstream by the baby's body that causes this normal transition to occur. However, with the CDH, unfortunately, this does not occur. And so what happens is uh, pulmonary vascular resistance, even in utero, ends up being much, much higher than what it would be. And then after the babies are born, the pulmonary vascular resistance remains high. And it's this sustained elevation in the pulmonary vascular resistance that causes babies to suffer from PPHN and causes them to be as sick as they are after birth. So we know inhaled nitric oxide is very, very effective in treating newborn babies with PPHN. However, the problem that we run into is that some babies, almost as high as 40% of babies, will fail to respond to inhaled nitric oxide. This is really most commonly seen in the setting of babies who have this vascular remodeling, which is the thickening of the blood vessels, and I'm going to show you some pictures in the next few slides as well as babies whose lungs just didn't grow normally in utero. And this is commonly seen with babies who have pulmonary hypoplasia, where the lungs don't grow well, or congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And so because nitric oxide is really minimally and sometimes not effective at all in this setting, um, we need to go back to the laboratory and try and find other therapies that may be, be very effective. So we all know CDH is a birth defect that occurs with a prevalence of 1 to 2,000 to 1 to 5,000. 80% of them are going to be on the, the left side through that foramen of Bachelet. And so essentially what happens is, and we all know this, abdominal contents herniate up into the chest, which results in lung hypoplasia. But it's these other two factors at the bottom that really cause these babies to be so sick and refractory to so many of the treatments that we have. And that's the decreased growth of the blood vessels inside of the lung or impaired angiogenesis, and then the vascular remodeling or thickening of the blood vessels that you see with this disorder. So this is a chest x-ray of a baby who had a right-sided CDH. So what we see over here is the uh, I'll walk over here. I know it's going to miss up the streaming. So this over here is the outline of the heart. All of this stuff over here is bowel that is filled up with air that has been able to herniate up into the, the chest. So this baby had a quite severe right-sided CDH, but he was able to survive. He was also born in Kansas and uh, was transferred to us within the first couple hours of life and stayed with us for over a year. So these are the changes that we see with congenital diaphragmatic hernia that makes it so hard to treat. So these are um, pictures that were taken from slides of baby's lungs with diaphragmatic hernia. Essentially what we see in the top panel on the right, or panel B, that would be a normal blood vessel where you see a nice thin rim around the blood vessel itself. Oh yeah, here. And then this side over here, we see a blood vessel from a baby with congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And if you look at the muscular layer inside of this blood vessel, you see how thick that muscular layer is. What you also see inside of the blood vessel, like here, this is the blood vessel lumen or where blood flows, is a much smaller area through which blood can flow through. It's those factors that cause the pulmonary vascular resistance to be so high after birth. The picture below is what a lung looks like from a baby with CDH. And I'm going to show you some pictures of normal lungs towards the end of the talk. 
we see a very, very thick blood vessel over here with a very small lumen for blood to flow through. But you see also that um, inside of this lung, there's been very little development of the lung itself. And when I show you some normal slides towards the end of the talk, you'll appreciate how severely abnormal that looks. So what we do then in the laboratory is we um, have a model with fetal sheep. Essentially, um, what we do to the fetal sheep is in uh, late gestation, so fetal gestation in sheep is about 150 days. So around 125 days, we'll perform a fetal surgery on the sheep. And so what we do is we go into the chest of the sheep. We isolate what's called the ductus arteriosus, which I'm sure some of you have the PDA. And we put a tie around that PDA and close the PDA off. And by doing that, uh, in utero, you create very, very severe pulmonary hypertension. And it's pulmonary hypertension that does not respond to nitric oxide at all. That's why we like this model a lot in terms of testing other therapies that may be useful. So what you see then 10 days later after you've closed the ductus arteriosus in utero is this is a blood vessel from a control animal and you see again a very thin wall around the blood vessel with a very big lumen. After closing the ductus arteriosus in utero, you see now a very, very thick wall around the blood vessel and a very small lumen for blood to flow through. What we do as well, which I'll show you in the next few slides, is place catheters into the blood vessels around the heart, which allows us to do measurements. So what we see in this panel over here, these are the uh, pulmonary artery pressures from normal control animals. You see they're very, very low. With our animals, after we close the ductus arteriosus in utero, the pulmonary pressure remains very, very high. <coughs> and on the bottom panel, the same is seen for the pulmonary vascular resistance. This is a control animal down here. <coughs> this is an animal here with pulmonary hypertension. So these are the different factors that determine how well a blood vessel relaxes after birth. And I don't know if I can slide in too much detail. But what we have on the top is the things we spoke about before. So in a normal baby, just breathing oxygen and breathing higher levels of oxygen than what would be seen when a baby's inside of the womb just breathing on its own, and then with breathing and opening and closing the lung, that's what's called shear stress, the blood vessels open up as well. And then the release of these different substances inside of the bloodstream is what causes the blood vessels to relax after birth. So we have these different pathways that these different medications or agents work on, sorry. So I'm sure some of you have heard of prostacyclin, that's this over here. So prostacyclin will work through this pathway to release, to cause the blood vessels to relax. And babies produce prostacyclin on their own. And so that's one way in which after birth, with the release of prostacyclin, the blood vessels will relax. Nitric oxide is produced as well by the body and acts through a different pathway to cause the blood vessel to relax. And we'll bring this slide up again later in the talk and talk about how the different drugs that we use for treating CDH act to help stimulate this pathway. On this side over here, we have our evil friend in the thelin. And that's the uh, substance that's you know, secreted in very, very high quantities in CDH babies. And that's what causes uh, constriction of the blood vessels and the high pulmonary vascular resistance. So like I said, you know, fetal sheep, after we've closed the ductus arteriosus, which is uh, over here, um, we then can place uh, catheters into the, the fetus, and those catheters help us to uh, measure different pressures. So I'm just going to run through this, this diagram so that you can understand a little bit better what we do. And this is something that's really, truly unique to, to Denver. So this is a very poor diagram of the heart, but what we have here essentially is the left side of the heart over here, the right side of the heart over here. This is the left atrium and the left ventricle, which then is pumping blood out to the body through the aorta. 
and this is the right side of the heart, the right atrium and the right ventricle, which is then pumping blood to the lungs. This is the PDA that we always talk about. And that's the structure that joins the pulmonary artery and the aorta while the baby's inside of the womb. So what we do is after we uh, open up the chest, we'll place a catheter in the left atrium so we can measure the pressure in the left atrium. We'll place a catheter in the main pulmonary artery, another catheter in the left pulmonary artery, and then this is what's called the flow probe, which goes around the left pulmonary artery so that we can measure the flow through the left pulmonary artery. We also place a catheter in the aorta so we can measure the blood pressure of the fetus at, at all times and then relate that to what the pressure inside of the pulmonary arteries are. So this catheter that's placed in the left pulmonary artery is used to infuse different experimental therapies into the fetus and then the animal after birth and then tells us how the pulmonary blood vessels relax in response to different treatments. So what you would see essentially is once you infuse the medication in over here, you could measure your flow through that blood vessel and you'd like to see that the flow increases so you get more blood flow to the lungs. But then as that circulates back to the heart, the pulmonary artery pressure over here should decrease as well. So placing these different catheters really allows us to measure these different pressures inside of the heart and then how the fetus responds to different treatments. And so essentially what Denver really became famous for is using this fetal sheet model to first of all understand how the normal fetus transitions after being born. And so um, we were instrumental in helping people around the country to understand how a baby goes from living inside of water to now breathing air. But then we were also instrumental in terms of studying nitric oxide gas and how it helps to dilate these blood vessels inside of the lung after birth. And so after we've gone through the last slide, now you can understand a little bit better. So this is mean arterial blood pressure. This is that pressure that's being measured inside of the aorta. This is the flow through that left pulmonary artery. And then this is the pulmonary vascular resistance which um, is measured just using a calculation based on the pressure and the flow inside of the, the blood vessel itself. So what we were able to demonstrate using nitric oxide gas in these fetal sheep is that when you give nitric oxide gas to them, and this is after birth, you see a decrease in, sorry, you see no change in your systemic pressure over here, but a decrease in your pulmonary artery pressure measured over there. And so that is what we call a selective effect. So inhaled nitric oxide is very effective in just dropping the pulmonary pressure, but then not changing the um, aortic pressure at all. What you saw with nitric oxide gas over here is a increase in the amount of blood flow to the lung. And with that increase in the amount of blood flow, you see a nice fall in your pulmonary vascular resistance as well. The other things that we were able to do in these studies is just look at the effect of ventilation on the ability of the fetus to transition. So nitric oxide gas is only added at this time point. Now what we do over here in this initial part of the experiment is we you know, intubate the fetus and then we ventilate them with 10% oxygen. So oxygen inside of the air is 21%. And so by giving 10% oxygen, we keep their oxygen level inside of their blood the same as what it would be as a fetus. And what we show over here is that when you just breathe for them with even 10% oxygen, you get a big increase in blood flow to the lung, as well as a fall inside of the, in the pulmonary pressure and a fall in the pulmonary vascular resistance as well. So just breathing is a very, very effective way in terms of decreasing the resistance inside of the lung. But what these studies were instrumental in doing is that they were able to allow us to say this drug might be very, very safe for using in babies, and this was in the late 80s, and that we should bring it out of the lab now and then to the hospital and see how it works.
And so in the late 80s, early 90s, this drug became FDA approved for treating babies with pulmonary hypertension because of how effective it is in decreasing just the pressure inside of the lung and not the pressure inside of the body and helping babies to um, transition normally when they're having difficulty. This slide kind of demonstrates the same thing again. It just demonstrates that at different doses of nitric oxide, which is something else you can do in the lab. So at five parts per million, you get an increase in flows of the lung to here. At 10, you get a little bit more increase. And then at 20, you get the maximal effect. And that's why we were able to determine that 20 parts per million might be the, uh, the best way to go in terms of what dose we use for inhaled nitric oxide. So these studies in our little fetal sheet were really, really important for getting this drug approved by the FDA for use in babies. And if you think to the number of babies we've treated with this drug now <coughs> and saved their lives, you know, these studies inside of the lab have really been instrumental. My hope is that with um, CDH, we can come up with some of the therapies that might be equally as effective as inhaled nitric oxide has been. And so this is what you see, like we said, in the late 80s is when we were messing around with nitric oxide inside of the lab. In the early 90s, it became FDA approved. And so this is ECMO utilization at Children's Hospital. This is ECMO utilization here at um, Children's Hospital in, in Denver. And what we see is uh, towards the end of the 80s and the early 90s, nitric oxide was approved. And with increased use of nitric oxide, ECMO utilization has significantly decreased to the point that outside of CDH, you know, we're doing these numbers have stayed fairly constant, one to two babies with ECMO a year. So outside of CDH, nitric oxide has really almost gotten rid of the need for ECMO. So then we go back to the lab and say, what else can we do inside of the lab to help try better treat babies with CDH? And so like we said, with um, our uh, model of closing the ductus arteriosus inside of the womb. This is a slide taken from that animal. What we see here is this blood vessel that I've been talking so much about, with the very, very thick wall and the very small lumen inside of it for blood to flow through. We also see a lung in the background that has very little um, kind of surface area for gas exchange to occur. This is contrasted over here to our normal blood vessel that we see over there with a very thin wall and a very wide open lumen. And so what we've done, this is what I've been focusing a lot of my time and attention on. Let's go back to the next slide. Is we've grown cells from, so what we've done now is we take these blood vessels outside of the animal and then essentially grow the cells from inside of that muscle layer. We grow them in little culture dishes. And then we look and see if those, those cells act differently from cells that are grown you know, from animals that, that did not have this constriction of the, the PDA inside of the womb. What we're able to show with those cells is that the cells from the animals that have pulmonary hypertension proliferate like crazy. And so here we grow the cells in the culture plate before days in culture and with the dark line being the cells from the animals with pulmonary hypertension, we see a much steeper curve and significantly increased growth inside of those cells, which tells us that um, that's probably why that muscle layer inside of the cells, inside of the blood vessel becomes so thick. So what we can do for our next set of experiments then is take those cells and treat them with different drugs and see how effective those drugs are um, you know, getting these cells to grow less fast. And so that's what we spend a lot of time doing is as drug companies come up with new therapies, um, we test those therapies inside of the lab to see how effective they are in terms of 
decreasing the ability of these cells to grow as fast as they are growing. Because that's really the way to help dramatically change the outcome for a baby with CDH. If we could get that very, very thick muscular vessel wall to become thin, and for those cells to stop growing as fast, we might be able to significantly change the course for our most severe babies. The other thing we do is um, try and study ways to get the lung to grow. Sorry, these pictures are pictures of lungs that are taken from the animal. So this is our animal with pulmonary hypertension. It has much, much smaller lungs than our animal who um, did not have the ductus closed inside of the, the womb. So all we can study as well is effective ways to try and get these lungs to grow so that they look more like that. The way we can quantify how small these lungs are is just comparing the weight of the lungs to the weight of the body. And we see with pulmonary hypertension, the lungs are much, much smaller in the animals with pulmonary hypertension. But what we see also is that along with the small lungs, the blood vessels inside of the lungs don't grow as well. So what we spent most of our time doing to try and find better ways to treat babies with CDH is to try and find ways that we can both get those lungs to grow faster than what they would grow normally, as well as try and get drugs and therapies that would be effective to try and get blood vessels inside of the lung to grow as well. What we can also do is take a different kind of cell out of the lung, which is called an endothelial cell, and that's a cell that helps to drive blood vessels to grow inside of the lung and see if we can test different therapies inside of a cell culture dish that may be effective in getting those cells to cause better blood vessels to grow. So when we take those cells out of the animal, the opposite is seen with the endothelial cell. So these are the cells now that are supposed to cause blood vessels to grow inside of the lung. What we see here is when we culture them for five days, the ones from the animals with pulmonary hypertension don't grow very well at all. And so finding ways to get those endothelial cells to grow better might be a very effective way in terms of getting new blood vessels to grow inside of the blood. These are kind of the neatest experiments that we do. And these are experiments using those endothelial cells where we can place them inside of a collagen matrix. So this is, if you look through the picture in a three-dimensional form, we have collagen sitting on this side, collagen sitting on the bottom, and then these structures inside of the collagen. When you place endothelial cells inside of the collagen, they form these little blood vessels, which then branch continually throughout the collagen structure. And so what we're able to see is that the endothelial cells that we took from our animals with pulmonary hypertension really don't form these blood vessel networks inside of the collagen as well as the um, vessels that are taken from the normal control animals over here as depicted by these two different pictures. So then we study different therapies that can cause these cells over here to form blood vessels as effectively as those cells over there. You know, and this is how we kind of quantify it by just measuring how long those blood vessels are inside as well as uh, measuring how many times they branch. And what we see is the cells from the animals with pulmonary hypertension don't grow as well and have less length, but they don't branch as well either. And so testing different drugs inside of the lab that may be effective in getting those cells to form longer blood vessels and more of those blood vessels is sometimes uh, an effective way in terms of finding new therapies that might help with babies with CDH. And so this is where we, we get to some of the new therapies that may be on the horizon. So we spoke about a little friend called the endothelin who causes a lot of problems for babies with CDH. So endothelin is um, secreted in babies with CDH in excessive amounts. And that's why some babies will be treated with an agent called Cosentin, that's an agent that blocks the effect of endothelin. And 
inside of the, the body. But then there's um, newer agents coming on the market that can be selective for different receptors that endothelin acts on. When endothelin acts on the A receptors, we get intense constriction of the blood vessels. And so, so we can take these new agents now that these pharmaceutical companies have developed and test them both in our animals as well as in ourselves to see how effective they are, first of all if they're going to be helpful and not harmful because drugs that sometimes work very well in adults can be very, very harmful to babies. But then um, also see inside of the cells how well they do to both decrease the ability of the smooth muscle cells to grow and then increase the ability of the endothelial cells to grow. And then if they are effective in the cells, take them to the whole animal and say how well do they work there. There's some new agents that have been developed called soluble guanylate cyclase agonists or Bay compounds. And those agents you know, have been shown to be very, very effective in animal studies. The reason we haven't started to use those in humans yet is because they, while they relax the blood vessels inside of the lung very, very well, they relax the blood vessels inside of the body too well as well. So a lot of the patients have had significant issues with dropping their blood pressure inside of their body along with the decrease in the blood pressure inside of the lung. Cialis, so then a full friend is something else that we're studying inside of the lab, trying to find a way to give a drug once a day instead of three or four times a day, like sometimes you have to do with sildenafil. And so we take Cialis to the lab and see how long the effect is inside of the animal. We give it to them, we measure their pulmonary pressure, we measure the blood flow to the lung, and then we wait and see how long it takes to return to normal. If it takes 24 hours, we know that's a drug that can be given once a day instead of three or four times a day, like sildenafil needs to be used. Hi, Adenosine is another drug that's used a lot in the cardiac ICU to treat pulmonary hypertension. We don't know how that drug will work in babies with CDH, so we take that to the lab, give it to our sheep, and see what kind of response they have to it. And the things you can do in the, the lab as well is um, study the effects of progenitor cells. For, um, there's been a lot of debate and controversy about the use of progenitor cell therapy for treating different disorders. And so what we've been able to do inside of the lab is to take stem cells from the babe, these are now the lambs, cords, grow those cells up in culture, <coughs> and inject them back into these animals and see what effect they have. And what we've seen is that these stem cells are very, very effective at treating all kinds of <coughs> disorders, but especially disorders of lung growth. So when you inject those stem cells back into the animals, the lungs grow quite quickly, and the number of blood vessels inside of the lungs grow very, very quickly, and all the effects from pulmonary hypertension can really be reversed by using stem cell therapy. And so I really feel like that's probably where the future of research in medicine is going where instead of ordering sildenafil, nitric oxide, oxygen, we'll be taking cord blood from babies right after birth, growing these cells up in culture, and then once they're ready, injecting them back into the baby to see if that can get the lungs to grow. It's very, very effective in getting the lungs and the blood vessels to grow. The only concern people have about using that is the risk for cancer down the line. Nobody knows what that risk really is. So with stem cell therapy now, there is um, a trial going on in adult patients with pulmonary hypertension to see if stem cells can decrease their pulmonary pressures and help improve their survival and quality of life. What's hard and what's difficult with getting these trials approved in babies is because something doesn't work in an adult doesn't mean it's not going to work in a baby. Because something works in an adult doesn't mean it will work in a baby. And so it's hard when trials fail in adults to get them approved for babies because once it didn't work in an adult, nobody's going to let you ever give that to a baby. So that's where the difficulty is with these studies. But at least in animal studies, stem cell therapy has been very, very effective 
because all babies have umbilical cord blood, it's really, really easy to isolate those cells and give them back to the baby and see how they do with it. And then there's new relational medicines that are, um, some of them being used already, because the cycle is, is used already, but there's other inhaled medications which you can, which we've been testing inside of the lab, to see if you can take away the effect on the body and just have that effect in the lung. If we inhale the medication into our lung, maybe it will relax only the blood vessels in the lung and not interfere with the blood vessels inside of the body. The next thing that we've moved into doing inside of the lab is, um, is a CDH model. So the history is what I presented in the first few slides. What we're doing now essentially is studying and performing these same studies in fetal sheep with CDH. So, um, <laughs> so as we said, gestation is about 145 to 150 days. A 16 days gestation, now we're talking about a probably 200 gram to 300 gram fetus. We'll open up the mom's womb, open up the chest of the fetus and remove the diaphragm on the left side. Um, removing the diaphragm on the left side then allows those abdominal contents to herniate up into the chest. The problem with all animal models is that it's a surgically created defect. CDH genetics might have much more to do with the disease than the actual defect in the diaphragm and the contents that herniate up into the chest. So whenever you surgically create a defect, it might not truly represent what goes on with the disease in humans. And I think it probably doesn't because you're completely ignoring genetics. This is not a sheep that was ever going to develop a CDH. The genetics did not predict that they were going to develop a CDH. And now you're creating that in the sheep. And so what we have here, essentially, this is the chest of the sheep up here. This is remnant of the diaphragm and what we see here is large amounts of intestine and stomach that have herniated up into the chest. This is the heart over here. And this is looking at it from the bottom, from the penis's belly. You see the holes in the diaphragm over there. And these are the abdominal contents after I've reduced them and taken them out of the chest. What we see again with this model is a marked disruption in the ability of the lung to grow. So this is our normal healthy control lung. There are lungs that we've taken out of the CDH animal and you see you know, a very, very abnormal appearing lung. So using the skills that we have from the other animals, we've now been able to um, place these same catheters that we spoke about earlier in the talk into these CDH animals. It's a lot more difficult to do because the heart is so shifted from the CDH that you've created. Um, we place those same catheters inside of the fetus and then make those same measurements that we've been able to make inside of our other pulmonary hypertension animals. And so these studies only started in the last year. All we've been able to do in the last year really is perfect the model, show that we can create it, show that we can place these catheters and look how normal, not normal, but how CDH animals have transitioned around the time of birth. And what we've seen really is that they have a, a very, very disordered transition. They're impossible to oxygenate, they're impossible to ventilate, and they all have very severe pulmonary hypertension. The problem with sheep studies is when it gets hot, sheep studies end because sheep do not just stay over the summer, and so all of that is on hold oh. <laughs> until kind of the, the winter months and things cool down again. But sheep can't get pregnant over the summer. Their, their body temperature is 40 degrees even in the winter, and then the summer it's too their body temperature is too high for them to, to get pregnant. And so, um, so you can't study sheep over the summer. But where we've gotten to with these studies is being able to show that it does mimic nicely the clinical disease. And what we'll start to look at over the next year is some of these newer therapies and see how effective they are at treating these, these animals. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is just um, some rodent models of disease. The last thing we do inside of the lab is we injure the lung with different 
treatments and by injuring the lung we can then study different therapies and their ability to rescue it. So these are the different ways that you can injure the lung both by starving the newborn rats or mouse for oxygen and giving them very low oxygen. By giving them too much oxygen you can damage the lung just as badly. By inhibiting some important growth factors you can damage the lung as well. And then there's essentially toxins which you can inject into the animals that help to injure the lung itself. So what we try and look for, so this is the lung structure of a normal animal. Well, we see these are blood vessels over here. And these are the air spaces inside of the lung that help to bring oxygen to the, the, the rats or the mouse pups and then um, get rid of carbon dioxide. If you look on the left, you see a um, on the side over here. You see um, you know a lung that's much less developed and much more simplified. And this is what we deal with a lot with with CDH is that um, the lung is much more simplified than what it should be. These little air sacs are supposed to continue to branch like crazy, like you see over there, and it doesn't happen at all with CDH. What we catch when mimicking these models is the thickening of the blood vessels. So you see here still a very thin blood vessel with a nice big lumen for blood to flow through. And now that we have a lung that's hypoplastic or underdeveloped, we can study different therapies to try and get that lung to grow. And before we take any of our therapies to the sheep, we always study them in rodents first because um, and the sheep studies are very, very expensive and difficult to do. And so um, this is another way that we can study um, blood vessel growth inside of the lung. So this is a normal rat lung. And essentially what we've done here is we've injected barium into the pulmonary arteries. So this is the main pulmonary artery, the right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery. And then you can look at how the um, pulmonary arteries branch as they go down into the lung using a barium injection into the, the pulmonary artery itself. What we see is with some of these agents that disrupt lung um, growth is that you can um, markedly decrease how these blood vessels branch inside of the lung when you use those different agents to impair the growth of the lung. So along with the disruption in the lung structure and the hypoplasia in the small lung, we also see a disruption in the growth of the blood vessel inside of the lung. And I just love these pictures because what you see over here is this is our normal lung over here with that same barium injection. This is our lung in which we try to impair the growth of the blood vessels and the growth of the lung itself. Now this is a lung that we've treated with one of our new therapies to see if we can get that lung to, to grow. Essentially what you see with that therapy is a complete return to normal of the barium angiogram and the growth of the lung. So now you take that therapy from the rat, and the studies were done in rats, to the sheep, and then hopefully as the next step to the human to see if we can help to improve outcomes for babies with CDH. This is just another example where we have uh, you know, a normal lung, a lung that's been injured, and this is with exposing the fetus to a very high amount of oxygen, and then treatments that have been initiated over here with a growth factor, which then helps that lung return to normal. This is uh, one of the studies that caused sildenafil to come um, into use. So this is a study done in rats as well. For a rat, this is a control. The rat was exposed to very high amounts of oxygen, which then damaged the lung. And then with the use of sildenafil, we were able to restore some of the structure to the, to the lung. So these are the kinds of studies that we do in the lab to help us bring therapies from the lab to the bedside, starting with rodent studies, moving to large animal studies, and those are either sheep or baboon studies. And then um, once you've studied them in large animals and shown effect in, in those large animals, to get studies approved in, in humans is possible as well. I don't know 
what happens then. Yeah, that was the end of the talks. <laughs> told me it's time to stop. <laughs> so yeah, I'll be happy to take questions now. Thanks for your attention. I just have one question. So the treatment of the well, the idea of the treatment behind increasing the growth of the lungs, like, would that be prior to birth or something like that? So even though the baby has hypertension, you might want to still treat it with the lungs and the lungs. Yeah, so those treatments are really hard to do, and some people have been working on that. So there's a group up in Canada that's been working on giving treatments to, now these are breath moms to see if it can affect the babies and you know they've shown they have a, a model of CDH in the rodents by giving a basically a pesticide to the rodents you can create CDH inside and that's why some people believe there's a very strong environmental effect on who develops CDH or not so they give this pesticide to the rodents they develop CDH not a lot like only about 20 or 30 percent of them and then they've been giving sildenafil to the moms to see and in those um, studies, they did show, you know, some effect on the growth of the lungs. The studies that we've all been doing are really after birth to see if we start something the first day a baby with CDH is born, you know, two or three weeks into their course, can you get the lung to grow and get more blood vessels to form in the lung as well as the thickening of those blood vessels to go away. Most of the studies we do are just over 10 day periods so you really are even if it's a baby who does go on to need ECMOs you started that therapy right away the hope is that you know, 10 to 14 days into their course even if they still need ECMO those therapies might help them to successfully transition off you know it's hard to do any studies where you're going to give a mom a drug to see what effect it has on the baby you know, um, a lot of my colleagues are doing those kinds of nutritional studies where they are trying to boost a mom's nutrition to get very small fetuses to grow. And those studies really haven't been very effective. And the main reason is just the, the placenta is, is a very effective filter. And um, things that the fetus doesn't need, the placenta usually gets rid of. <laughs> so we all know CDH babies are quite healthy while they're in the, the womb. And so, placenta is likely to just get rid of things that the, the fetus doesn't need. We'll see if that's where those studies go down the line. We haven't pursued them very much just because we find it, feel it's going to be difficult to get any research study set up in humans where we're giving a drug to the mom to try and help the baby. And that's why what Dr. Cumberland will talk about tomorrow in terms of the fetal interventions at least seems like the way to go. Now, at least the balloon tracheal occlusions, uh, if you can prevent preterm labor, it's been really shown to be quite effective in terms of getting the lung to grow. There are a lot of risks to that procedure as well, which you'll hear about tomorrow. And so, our hope is that we can find drugs that you can start as soon as the baby's born and then safely give to them for 10 days, two weeks, three weeks, and see. The lung will grow in response to those therapies. Have they, as far as um, any kind of genetic or environmental links to ketosis, is there, has there been anything in the world that seems to indicate this would happen to the person? Okay, so, um, so in the last year at our big kind of pediatric meeting, the one of the doctors from the Boston study, which you'll hear about, presented some of their preliminary findings. And it's really a little disappointing. Like, I think it's important to give blood for those studies to see what can be found. But they isolated four genes, really, that they thought played a big part in CDH and then went back to mice. And they were really, really neat studies. Knock those genes out in mice, which you can do quite easily. So those four different genes that in four different kind of strains of mice were knocked out. And what they found is that CDH happened in all of them, which is a really, really neat finding. But in two out of the four genes, the lung and the CDH animals was like five times the size that it was supposed to be. And then in the other two genes that they knocked out, they really, there was no diaphragm, but there wasn't 
like the CDH that we deal with at the bedside. So the lung was small, the lung was underdeveloped, but it didn't look like what we see with CDH. Okay. So the lung was small, but it was not underdeveloped. It looked kind of structurally normal in those other two genes that they knocked out. And so while they were able to make the diaphragm not form by knocking out those genes, they weren't able to produce what we see at the bedside in terms of CDH. And especially the first two genes, the lungs were like, yeah, <laughs> the lungs extended crazy. all the way down into the mouse's wow. belly, and they were huge. And so, so there's clearly a lot more that goes into it than just genetic, but um, and just the whole in the diaphragm. And that might be a bigger part of it. I think what we were worried about a lot with our sheep CDH model is that you can create a hole in the diaphragm that you might not mimic the whole disease. And we definitely don't because um, all the issues that we deal with with shock, the left heart, and blood pressure problems, we don't see in our sheep at all. So they have bare pulmonary hypertension, they have very small lungs, you can't deliver oxygen or get rid of carbon dioxide, but their left heart functions beautifully. And have, no matter how sick they are, they have totally normal systemic blood pressure. And so you just can't, unfortunately, in these animal models, mimic what goes on you know, in the human baby completely. But, you know, that study, at least, that they're doing in Boston is really amazing because as they find a new gene that they think is important, they then go back to the mouse and say, I'm going to get rid of that gene completely in the mouse and see what happens. And because those four genes they thought of didn't have any effect, doesn't mean the next four aren't going to be the answer. It's just kind of interesting to see that these are the four from all the families that they've studied that were repetitively coming up and seeing as normal. But then the other problem is a mouse is not a human as well, so knocking out that gene in a mouse might not produce the same effect as what you would get in a human. Is there any indication when an infant presents with CDH, you have them in the NICU, whether the, the inhaled nitrous oxide will or will not work? When do you... When do you know that? Is it something very similar with all cases, or are they all different? No, I mean, that's what I love so much about CDH and all my colleagues is that every baby is completely different. That's what's so hard about treating this disorder is that you could have a baby that has the exact same fetal workup and fetal markings and findings, and then you find that after birth, that baby behaves completely differently from a different baby. Using the heart ultrasound and echoes, you can sometimes tell which babies are going to respond. But you know, it's often when you treat those babies expecting that they would respond like a baby who didn't have a CDH for it, and sometimes they just yeah. don't. You know, I think there is something that ECMO does provide in terms of allowing you to get the lung to its healthiest yeah. point so that the nitric oxide can actually get down into the lung to work. But sometimes in some of the babies it just doesn't work at all. And there definitely are some CDH babies that it does yeah. work in. So I don't want to say that it doesn't work in all CDH babies. Premature babies than CDH babies. It's more consistent. Nitrous oxide. No, for sure. I mean, the effect in CDH baby is very unpredictable. You know, and so we, the big studies that were done in the CDH population really showed no benefit when they randomized babies to nitric oxide versus no nitric oxide. It actually showed that the babies who did receive nitric oxide early in the first few days of life often did worse than the babies who didn't. We haven't used it a lot here in the first few days of life unless the baby's going to need ECMO and then we've used it as a last ditch effort to try and prevent ECMO, but it really hasn't helped most of the time to prevent ECMO. When a baby's that sick, ECMO is really the only thing you can offer at that point. And so, um, so it, it, it's hard because I think there's a lot of benefit to inhaled nitric oxide outside of the first few days of life. Just in the first few days, there's so much stuff going on. At least the studies have shown us 
usually not a good idea to that's what's so hard because the moms are incredibly motivated and would do anything that would help yeah. their baby, but it's hard to justify doing something that might hurt the mom for a baby that has such a severe birth defect. Yeah, and that's what the mom wants most of the time, even if it's going to put her at risk. So it's tough. And eventually the OB says, I'm not doing it like you said. Well, I mean, it's a matter of getting everybody on the same page for a and trying to find things that will help. That's why research is so important, because once you have research studies set up, then it really is up to the family and not up to the doctor anymore. Yeah. You present the research study to the family, and the family decides, I want to do this, or I don't want to do this. And once in the next year we will start doing those fetal tracheal occlusions over here and that's again going to be a research study. The family decides I want to put myself at risk, I want to put my baby at risk, and I want to try and do something that might potentially help. But that's not the doctor saying, we're going to do this to you, your baby. This is the family deciding I want to take that risk. You know? So um, that's what we've tried to do a lot with our management of CDH babies with these new treatments and therapies is to make it all a part of research and say, we don't know if this is going to help or not, but you can help us to determine that. Are there any questions online? Okay. I don't have any coming through, but that doesn't mean that there isn't. We have some, we have some issues early on. I have a question for you. Um, in terms of parents um, and communication with, with the doctors in the hospitals, what is a critical point during their pregnancy to be able to, to meet with these parents and um, consult with them as far as a treatment plan and what their options are? Is there a, is there a, is there a golden time? And then the same with um, once the child is delivered. The best time is different people for the baby. Go on to talk about any research studies. I'm sure everybody in this room knows once the baby's born those first few days. Or I don't think it's fair to consent anyone for a study in the first few days. Or have all those emotions. Your baby's really struggling. Everybody's tired, including the medical team, <laughs> you know, trying to take care of the baby and keep it growing. So the best time is before the baby is born to talk about research studies in terms of fetal interventions. You know, they need the tracheal occlusions need to be done before 28 weeks. So you really want to try to get the mom in early so you can first of all get the early imaging studies with the MRI and the ultrasound and other things to see if the baby's a candidate. Because we are going to treat all babies. It's just going to be the babies who have very low chance of survival after birth. And so what we're doing is essentially picking a population that has less than 20% survival after birth. Anyone who has a better chance of survival than that then gets excluded from any fetal study and then could be included in a study that occurs after birth. You really want to pick babies who you know have a very, very small chance of survival for the fetal intervention study. And that's what they picking <coughs> tracheal occlusions is babies who based on MRIs, fetal echo and ultrasound have a less than twenty percent chance of survival. So those babies need to come in before twenty two weeks so that you can get all that imaging done and then decide if you're gonna do the procedure. So what just what what would determine that percentage? What do you guys use? Um, so you look at the lung head ratio, look at the size of the blood vessels inside of the lung by both MRI and by uh, echo, and then the uh, percent size of the lung compared to what it should be. So that's probably the biggest factor. So, so if the lung is 15 percent of the size that it should be. Um, 
evidence, but then you need to have a lambda ratio less than one as well. And some other criteria in terms of the size of the blood vessels inside of the lymph node the MRI. And so using six different criteria to determine that the main ones being the MRI size of the lymph. So if you look at the total number of CDHs around the country, only 15% of babies would qualify for that. Just because um, you don't want to put babies at risk doing a fetal surgery who really might have a chance to survive without it. So you really have to pick the most severe babies, and that's only 15% of the babies out there that would meet those criteria. The other reason for picking that group is that they have been doing these studies in San Francisco for years and they haven't shown any benefit when they pick a less sick group of babies. So the San Francisco studies have all failed because the babies who did not get the fetal intervention landed up doing just as well as the babies who did. The thought behind that is that they just pick babies who are going to be too healthy after birth. Is there a survival ratio between boys and girls that is an outstanding that you know that you're going to pick up a baby that is female versus female? I'm not, I'm not sure about that. You know, definitely with prematurity, females have a much higher survival than males when babies are born early. But in terms of CDH, I'm not sure if there's a sex difference in terms of survival. have a survival of 50% and now the survival is probably around 66 to 70 percent. Those are where the numbers play out now. So anywhere you read or see that somebody has a survival of 88% or 95%, they just they're not being they're not lying about it. What they're doing is picking a period of time that they had good outcomes. You know, and I can go back and look at our hospital in the last two years and we've had very few babies who have not survived. Those have improved our numbers from 65% to 70%. But if I just publish over the last two years, my survival is going to be you know, around 90%, which is not fair to put out in the literature and tell families that our survival is 90%, because it's not. It's just we have had a nice period of time over the last two years where we've had some babies who were less severe than others and had some severe babies who did survive, but the next 10 babies we treat might not take, so it's not fair with publishing that study. So in the Boston were publishing a few years ago that they had an 88% survival with CDA talking that the way they changed, they changed the way they were ventilating the babies and said that that dramatically improved their outcome. But now they just published a study last month in one of the pediatric surgery journals where so they haven't gone back on what their saliva was before, but have had, since that study was published in 2008, have not had a four-year period where their saliva hasn't been great. So, so that's what happens. You, know, you get periods of time where you have less severe babies and have some really nice outcomes, even with some severe babies, and then you have periods of time where, where nobody survives, and it gets very, very frustrating and hard to deal with and so that's why there's a lot of work to be done. So would you say that it's fair to say that no hospital has a cutting edge technology that another does not percentages? I think there's differences. Let me ask you a question the best way and say that there's some hospitals that should not be treating babies with CDH. There's a lot of hospitals that are very good at treating babies with, with CDH. And 
you know, there's no cutting edge therapy that dramatically changes the outcome, but doing things badly can cause a baby who should survive to hospital. And that's the places that have a lot of experience with therapies. Babies, you know, I think, are all equal. This, but there are mistakes you can make in the course of caring for a baby with CDH where you know, can dramatically alter the course of the baby you should. We were told about the percentages. Um, basically, we were told that we should have 10 babies coming with a good lung function. We have 100% survival rate for that year. We can have the next year 10 babies come in all with poor lung function. None survive. We have a zero percent survival rate for that year. So you can skew your your, your stats any way you want to go. Oh, for sure. And that's exactly what happened in that Boston study. So they were looking at exit to ECMO procedure. The babies are placed on ECMO right out of the womb before even given a chance to be resuscitated or born. You know, and so in that. 10 year period leading up to their actual research study, they had a survival that was around 55% for the babies who were treated with exit to ECMO. And then they actually did a research study where they said they were going to study this in a research trial. What they found is in the exit to ECMO groups, the survival was 20%, you know, during that study period versus 50% of babies who were not treated with an exit to ECMO procedure and still. Survive. So the numbers changed a lot. Ten years before they did their study, 55% survived. And then once they started their study, which went from 2004 to 2010, you know, only 20% survived. And so of the, those very, very severe babies. And so if you pick those first 10 years and you publish that data, then you can say that for the worst babies where only 20% should survive, we got 55% to survive. And then you actually go to the next 10 years and the number that truly should survive are the ones that are going to. So it's, it's hard, but really to answer your question, there, there's no magic bullet for treating this disease. There's definitely things you should do. Hospitals that take care of all these babies are not doing those things. But anyone who says, I've found the cure for CDH, you know, would be world famous. <laughs> These are spunky kids. Yeah. Uh, what, what are things that uh, people who are pregnant with a CDH baby need to look for in a hospital that they choose? Obviously, police need to look for in a hospital that should not be treating CDH <laughs> kids because they don't have the ECMO and things like that. Like, the bed, because, you know, nowadays, the Facebook and all these different ways of getting no other CDH um, or people that are expecting CDH. Not for sure. I mean, I think the things to look for are how many babies do they treat a year, how many ECMO patients do they treat a year. Those are probably the most important things. If any place that treats less than five babies a year probably shouldn't be doing it anymore. And the places that really have the expertise are the ones treating 15 to 30 babies a year. And even with how many babies you treat, how much ECMO they do, it's important as well. Because you don't want your baby to need ECMO and then end up having a complication related to ECMO because the ECMO side of things is not. And then you want a place that really commits to these patients from the prenatal side to until they go to college. You know? <laughs> if they're able to. So you don't want a place that's going to take care of them, discharge them, and they'll be the end of that. So we want a place that has follow-up through after the NICU and through the first few years of life. You know? we, we actually have a question that is what questions to ask the hospitals and doctors. And it's a number of patients do they treat? Do they use that How long have they been using that That's one. And then there are lots of personal questions that many parents think of, like their NICU policy. Because all the time. Yeah, for sure. And those are important as well, because as you know, it's 
very disruptive to his family. So what other support and services do they have for the family yeah. and siblings and other things? And another big question I would have out there is just, is there a home hypertension program in that hospital? Do they have expertise in treating that? So babies who can get through the first two to three weeks of life, the form of hypertension becomes the factor that really determines their outcome after that. And if you don't have the expertise to treat that, the ability to take the baby safely to the cath lab and do cardiac catheterization if it's needed, and have experience with these different treatments that are not you know, in any pediatric handbook that you would read, these are just treatments that places who specialize in this are using and are aware of it. So you want to know as well that there's a pulmonary hypertension team and there's, you know, baby you know, that we know about who got to three or four weeks of age and still had that pulmonary hypertension and uh, you know, they contacted us with some recommendations to make, which we made, and then you know, the next day they ended up discontinuing support because they just said, well, we're not those recommendations and those treatments and we feel like we've reached the end. You know. and for some babies, you have, for all CDH babies, you have to be able to step out of your comfort zone and say, look, I'm not comfortable with this because it's not something I do every single day, but this is something that can truly help this baby to survive you know, and take a leap and try to do that. So you want a place that is very, very comfortable with pulmonary hypertension. Dr. Gein, I have a quick question for you. I'm sorry if someone had their hand up behind me. Can you, if, if we can wave a magic wand today and say, Dr. Gein, what do you need in your lab to further this research? Um, could you could you just touch on that, please? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's becoming hard because you know, the, uh, the the regu the regulations around doing animal research are getting quite quite strict. So. Uh, so they tried, they, they're trying as hard as they can from, not a government standpoint, but just from different organizations to shut down all these labs and so research from being done on animals, which you can understand why people would want that to happen. And that, that's probably become the biggest challenge of the hurdle to doing research now is, is all the rules and laws that are in place. So every time you have an animal that dies unexpectedly, you have to contact the National Institute of Health and report the animal to them, and they send an investigation team out. And so instead of spending your whole day doing research, you spend your whole day meeting with different regulatory authorities to try and you know, explain to them what happened, which you know, sometimes you know, animals do die unexpectedly, and it's not through my fault or anyone's fault. It's just part of the work we do. But then you'll end up spending three hours meeting with somebody to explain that to them. And it's not so much the government's fault as much as that they have thousands of people standing outside Washington <laughs> protesting against what we're trying to do here. So, so if I could wave a magic wand and say, make those protesters <laughs> <laughs> go away. People go away because then I could spend three hours studying doing research and finding cures for these things rather than sitting in meetings. So no, no, we're on to getting rid of the protesters. <laughs> Could you tell me a percentage of, of your day or week or month or even a quarter of a year that is spent in your lab versus bedside? And what, what you would like to see is, again, the magic one. Where would you like to be? Yeah, it's in the earlier part of your career. You spend large amounts of time in the lab and less time at the bedside. So. You know, I, uh, I'm a little bit different from other people who've taken that track in that I've really committed to CDH babies. So when there's CDH stuff going on, I, I really leave the lab completely and I have an assistant and she really keeps the lab going. And I spend all my time in dealing with CDH. Once CDH babies stabilize and things are going better and my kind of expertise and knowledge is not so much needed on a day-to-day -day basis, I get to go back there. So let's say in a year I spend probably 40% of my time at the bedside and 60% of my time in the lab. Um, what we'll probably see over the next few years is kind of gotten a lot of 
applied for grants from different organizations. And as you get more funding and more experience, you can really leave the lab completely because you can get the help you need to not have to do and spend much time there. And that's that's essentially the way things will probably go in the next four or five years is that I will, the lab will keep going, but I won't be there really at all. And that's kind of where Dr. Cumberholm is at now. So he does a lot of laboratory research as well. Um, but he's never in the lab at all, and he's 100% at the bedside and clinical and doing surgery and surgical procedures. So that's how it evolves. The first kind of year out of training, you probably spend 80% of your time in the lab and 20% clinical, and then it just increases. Most people still at my level are spending much more time in the lab than I do, but I feel like it's a true have a passion for CDH and the care that's needed for the babies. So, you know, I can't be there as often as I, I should be. So what it means is just a lot of after hours time catching up. So if I have to be in the hospital for taking care of a CDH when I should have been in the lab, then you just like going at night or on the weekends or at other times to do what needs to be done there. But, the career in the lab doesn't move forward as quickly, but it makes for a much more rewarding career, I feel, because we do what we do in the lab so we can help babies. And it doesn't, to me, there's no point in you know, leaving my, using all my skills in the lab and not bringing them to the bedside to try and help, help babies. So, so I feel like if I had to give up the bedside to go be in the lab, I would just give up the lab because I think I became a doctor to take care of patients and the lab has been a great place to try and answer some of these questions and my hope is that we'll have these therapies rolling in these treatments in place in the next five to ten years that all my work in the lab will come to fruition and we'll actually be able to help babies with all these different drugs we've tested but the end of the day there's nothing more rewarding than being at the bedside and helping the patients and interacting with the family. Do you teach also? Um, not a lot. Like you know, a lot of teaching at the bedside. So like, like I don't teach at the bedside. Okay. Mommy. Is there anything you'd like to close with today? A thought or a <clears throat> something that comes to mind to for us to take home with us as as just food for thought. I think the, the way I'd like to close is really to say that research is really the only way to get it solve the puzzle of this disease. There's both research in the lab and research at the bedside. So whatever research people can be involved in and that that includes the question of autopsy that always comes up unfortunately when babies don't survive. The autopsy is hard for families to put the baby through that really provides often some of the most useful information in terms of but we need to take back to the lab and study some more in the, the lab. So the only way we can really understand why a baby didn't survive with a CDH is you know, with an autopsy so that we can look at their heart and look at their lungs and say, was this baby really supposed to survive or not? And we have had um, some babies at autopsy where we've been quite surprised with how much lung they really had there for how badly the baby did after the baby was born. And which helps because then you know it's not all about the lungs being small and there has to be so much more that needs to be studied and worked out. And so, so the way I'd really like to close is just say that all research is important. If any of you guys in contact with any families with CDH and they ask you about autopsy, it's, it's a really important part of doing research and if there are research studies that people want to enroll you guys in, you definitely read through the studies and understand fully what you're assigning consent for, but um, most of the studies are being done not because people are trying to experiment on you or your baby, but people just don't know you know, what the best treatment is, and especially for the babies with severe CDH. You know, nitric oxide is the best drug possible for babies who don't have severe CDH, but for babies with severe CDH, it's a terrible drug to use. And why is that the case? 
So when people want to study these kinds of things, they want to study it just so they can really work out what the best way to treat these babies are. And people are really aren't trying to treat you or your baby as a kind of little guinea pig or mouse or rat. They, they really want to know the best way to treat it. Because there's a lot of times we go to the bedside and say, we're going to give this medication to your baby, but we really don't know if that's the right or wrong thing to do. Research is really the only way to solve that question. You know, the problem becomes when you can't do these studies, it's almost impossible to do research now. To answer these questions becomes impossible. And so Denifil is a perfect example of that. So that's a drug that a lot of our babies go home on. We tried to study it and um, you know, a lot of families would not study it outside of CDH, which trying to study it, but only 50% of families will sign consent for the study. And then people just get frustrated and start to use it and it becomes a standard therapy and that's essentially what's happened. So we don't know, right? So we treat your baby with sildenafil and other babies with sildenafil, but we don't know if we didn't treat them with sildenafil, would things really be the same? And that's why research is so you have to be able to say we're going to treat this baby with sildenafil and this baby not with sildenafil and see if the baby gets treated with sildenafil does better because research is so hard to do because most families don't want to be a part of it you just can't study these things and then you just have to say I really believe this is going to help so I'm going to do it but it really does not help now we know with sildenafil that it's safe and it's fine so don't worry <laughs> But there's so many other treatments out there that we really want to study but can't because if we go to families, like I said, if we approach 100 families, only 50 of them will sign up to do a study, which makes it very, very hard when you have a defect like CDH. If you're losing 50% of your families, that's very few babies that you can really study. How many families do you know that have more than one CDH baby? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know of one other family. The, with the one in England or the one in Texas? No, as a, as a family who was treated in Cincinnati. Oh. So, because there's three of us that I know of right now. Yeah, I can get you there. We're involved in all the studies, all three of us, so. The no, system. Was there those families were there? They have survivors. They were time around the, fir the one in Texas, their first baby was not did not survive, um, and their little girl right now she's doing well in the hospital. And then the other babies um, were in England, a boy, a girl, and then a boy. No, either way. And they um, used the tracheal occlusion, the balloon, in both babies, and they both survived. And then I've got my survivor, and then my unaffected, and then my my baby in the NICU right now. So there's a family in a who has extensive family members. Like an uncle. He had an uncle had it. He's a survivor. He had children who did not survive. One was did not have it. But there's just the uncle, his brother had children with it. I mean, it's a branch, and they are being put down.